<clears throat> Hi guys, welcome to chapter four. Just letting my computer catch up here. Gosh. All right, we're on to chapter four. Um, I'm using the ebook here to go over chapter four. Chapter four is one section of the tax return adjustments for adjusted gross income, which is that AGI number we went over at the start. And in this chapter, we're just covering those specific deductions. Now you can see them right here in this exhibit 4-1. Um, it's really, and, and this is on schedule one. So now on schedule one, there's income and these deductions for AGI. And there's only this handful of deductions for AGI. You can see them listed here. Um, I'll show you on the prior year tax return, um, we had income and then we had the adjustments to adjusted gross income. And they're very similar, but there have been some changes. And then the tax return continues. And so these days now um, it's really handled um, in getting to adjusted gross income. Right, so we have our income, and then we it just says to subtract line 36 from schedule one. So if we go to the irs.gov, we go to 1040 and schedules one through six. Why are we in where's my fund? Here we go. So our schedule one is the specific deductions for AGI. Now, of course, we have a whole chapter on this because there is a calculation for each one. So this is no longer on our tax form, but it's on this schedule and it's all of these items here. So it's only if you have an amount on line 36 that that is subtracted for adjusted gross income on line seven. See, it says subtract line, schedule one, line 36 from line six and you put it on line seven. So these are just a handful of deductions that specifically qualify for AGI. We have educator expenses. This is a small deduction. We have certain business expenses. Um, this is very uncommon. It's for very specific jobs. They've really done a lot away with a lot of Form 2106, which used to be unreimbursed employee job expenses, which was an itemized deduction, but they did away with a lot of that. Um, educator expenses are really limited to high school, health savings account deduction, and there's a special form for that as well. The moving expense deduction, and there's a special form for that. This has been majorly changed. It used to just be that you had to move for work and you would qualify for this deduction, but now it's only for members of the armed forces. Then we have a bunch of self-employed related deductions you get to deduct half of your self-employment taxes because um, when you're employed through a company, you pay self-employment tax and the employer splits it with you. That's that Social Security and Medicare. So self-employment taxes, their name is deceiving because it makes it sound like it's just a tax on the self-employed. It's not. They're payroll taxes, which apply to everything, everyone. Um, but you get a deduction for it here as the business, right, so to speak, as a company, since they get usually pay half and deduct half. Since you're paying it all, you get to deduct half for the income tax calculation. Then we have some more um, 
self-employment related deductions, related to retirement, related to health insurance, penalty on early withdrawal of savings, alimony paid, you have to enter the recipient's social security number, but it's a deduction for you. And the person who receives the alimony includes it on schedule one is income, but this does not include child support, which we talked about under child support on the other side of it. Um, IRA deduction, most people are doing the Roth these days, so you don't get an IRA deduction. Student loan interest deduction, up to 2,500 is deductible as long as you're below a threshold. Reserved, reserved, that means more things are possibly coming or they're leaving the spaces open in the form for last minute adjustments and changes. So of course, for each of these, there's specific rules, limitations, maximum amounts, and that's what you'll be going through more in the chapter. Let's see. So we'll start by looking at student loan interest. So this isn't your college expenses. When you get college expenses, those qualify for one of three credits or deductions. Uh, there used to be a tuition and fees deduction. It looks like that's been removed. Um, but the credits were normally better anyways, and you got to choose the most advantageous. That's not this. Student loan interest is the interest you're paying when you pay your loans after you're done college, when you start paying. So that's what this is about. Now, the maximum amount you can deduct is 2,500, but there's also limitations based on modified adjusted gross income, which is, you know, a special threshold limitation for this specific situation. And of course, what you're paying has to be qualified that um, is usually fairly straightforward. So Gilda borrowed, we'll look at this first example, 5,000 for higher education expenses on a qualified education loan. In 2018, she began making payments on the loan while she was still a dependent at her parents' house. That means that she cannot claim the student loan interest deduction also. Um, she has to no longer be a dependent. So they list, um, <clears throat> we'll go through the next example. September, LeBron spent 3000 on qualified education expenses. He received a loan for 2800 in the same month as he paid the expense. During the semester, he receives a scholarship of 500 that he properly excluded from his income. LeBron's qualified educational expenses then, the scholarship comes off first, right, of his expenses, are only 2,500. As a result, interest on 2,500 of the $2,800 loan will be eligible for student loan interest. So it's just showing that you have to actually have expenses for the loan that are qualified. If you get a scholarship, then that reduces your expenses um, when it's non-taxable. So there are some other um, limitations. The biggest one here is the threshold um, limit. So basically that modified AGI, once the total income of the taxpayer exceeds that, there's a limitation. Now, um, the limitation, so modified AGI starts with AGI on the tax return, that line seven we just looked at, but you need to add back any deduction for student loan interest, any foreign U.S. or Puerto Rican income that's excluded, and any deduction taken for tuition and fees. So you add all of that back, um, and that amount is your threshold. So for a single person earning more than 65,000, many people don't have those extra things. It's primarily you know, earned income, W-2 income, self-employment income. But regardless, once all of that is greater than 65,000 for a single person or 165,000 for a married couple, then you have to apply this limitation. 
So you take whatever the actual student loan interest deduction was, and then you times it by a fraction. For married taxpayers, it's the amount your income, that modified AGI threshold, exceeds 135,000, the limit amount here, 135. Or for a single person, the amount that exceeds 65, the limit. And it's divided by 15,000 as a single person or 30,000 as a married person. So that means once you are $30,000 over the threshold as a married couple or 15,000 over that threshold as a single person, then there's no more deduction. So we'll see this in this example. Al and Marianne borrowed $30,000 on a qualified educational loan to pay for qualified higher educational expenses for their two children. During 2018, they paid $1,800 of interest on the loan. Al and Marianne's modified AGI on their joint return was $155,000. So they're over the limit. So we're going to take the $155,000 that they're over minus the limit. So 35, 45, 55, 6, uh, so they're 20,000 over divided by 30,000 times the amount of student loan interest that they could deduct, which was 1,800. And so that means 1,200 when we go 18 times 20 over 30, so two thirds, 1,200. 1,200 is disallowed. So then you see down here the permitted deduction. is 1800 minus 1200 600 dollars is what they can deduct and once they're at 30,000 above once they get to 165 it's going to be zero okay this is i just passed this is the form 1098e that reports um student loan interest paid during the year. So you should get that if you paid interest to a lender. Now we'll go on to the next deduction. Health savings accounts. So health savings accounts are used when you're in a high deductible plan. That's also abbreviated HDHP. Um, so it allows you to contribute to a savings account basically before tax that you can spend on medical expenses. Now you fill out form 8889 Often this is part of a fringe benefit uh, for people who don't, you know, can't get access to health care. And so they have a high deductible plan and a health savings account. This is the form that gets attached. Um, if, if it's not already deductible, so oftentimes if it's deducted through paychecks for someone um, on a W-2, then they're just attaching the form with their return and it's working out the calculation, which you'll learn about here. Alternatively, they get a deduction for it if it wasn't already before tax, their contributions to the health savings account. So these are requirements of the high deductible health plan that have to be met to qualify to be able to contribute before tax to a health savings account for $6,900 for a family, or as a single person, $3,450. Um, it is, it's really the nuances of this small deduction for someone to be able to spend $6,000 on, on medical expenses is uh, quite nuanced. So individual coverage, the minimum deductible has to be $1,350, family coverage $2,700, and the maximum deductible in annual out-of-pocket expenses can be up to $6,650 or $13,300, double that. 
If the taxpayer is over 55,000, then they get to contribute an additional 1,000 per year. Contributions made by a qualified individual are for AGI deduction, assuming that everything is met. And so distributions from HSAs are tax-free health savings accounts if they use them to pay for qualified expenses. And that's what you're calculating on the form 889 is, okay, was anything you spent from your HSA uh, need to be taxed or do you meet all the qualifications for it to be excluded? So that's a second uh, one of our deductions for AGI. Now, moving expenses. So moving expenses used to be a really great deduction. If you move for work, you could take a deduction basically of the cost. Like there's nuances about the details, um, you know, how many days you can be in a hotel and um, all these little things. However, it was still a very big deduction um, obviously moving his expenses, but now it's been changed so that this is only for U.S. Armed Forces on active duty and because of a permanent change of station, they can deduct their unreimbursed moving expenses. Now, it's unlikely since I think that the Army pays for them to move in many scenarios, um, then they wouldn't get a deduction at all. But otherwise, if they meet this criteria, then they would be able to take the deduction. Um, you know, if the government reimburses for services that they pay to move, then those amounts are only deductible if they're actually the reimbursement is included as wages on the W-2. If it's just reported in box 12 as a reimbursement and not taxed as income, as a higher salary, think of it as like a bonus, then it's not uh, deducted. So my guess is this is not going to be deducted very often for military people. So there's specific rates. Let's say you drive to move. The standard mileage rate for moving expenses is 18 cents per mile. Um, plus any actual out of, out of costs for, uh, they can use actual method for gas and oil or the standard mileage rate method, which is usually more advantageous. They can also deduct parking fees and tolls. Um, a foreign move is a move from the U.S. to a foreign country or from a foreign country to another foreign country. It is not a move from a foreign country to the United States. For the foreign move, the deductible moving expenses um, are expanded to include moving household goods, personal effects to and from storage units as well and storing those items for the time that they're away on active duty. So that's a big difference. Previously, you couldn't include storage for more than 30 days. So they've changed some of this to really gear it towards um, military. So they will complete Form 3903. We can see um, part of that form here anyways. The deduction for one half of self-employment tax, that is very straightforward. That's 15.3% is self-employment taxes, and they get to deduct 50% of that. Self-employed health insurance is deductible. Um, as long as it's not subsidized in any way, right? It has to be, um, if you get like subsidized health care, then that's not deductible. It has to be um, health insurance that you pay for because you're self-employed. Um, penalty on early withdrawal of savings. So this is referring to time savings accounts like CDs. 
essentially an investment. If they're getting uh, an interest penalty, they are allowed to deduct it, which has always kind of surprised me. Um, alimony pay, we've pretty much covered that when we talked about including alimony in income in the last chapter as gross income. If any part of alimony is based on when a child becomes a certain age or goes to college, then that portion is not alimony, it's child support. And it doesn't matter what the uh, divorce agreement or the lawyers call it for tax purposes, we don't buy it. We say it's child support. Otherwise, alimony paid is deductible by the person who paid it and the person who receives it includes it in gross income. Now this educator expense uh, has always been an interesting one. You get to deduct $250 of qualified education expenses. And this is only for um, a person teaching within, not college, within um, grade school and high school. So kindergarten through 12th grade, they must teach at least 900 hours um, and they must be a teacher, instructor, counselor, principal, or aide. Um, and they get a whopping $250. Now, if two spouses are both qualified, then they can take up to 500, but they must have taught for 900 hours during the year. So here's an example, William and Lakeisha are married and will file a joint return. Both are eligible educators. William spent 420 on his expenses for fourth grade and he received $190 reimbursement. So we have to take 420 minus 190, right? To see the amount that would qualify. Obviously a reimbursement doesn't qualify. Lakeisha spent 360 pertaining to her 11th grade science class and received no reimbursement. So in total, they spent 780 and received a 190 reimbursement for a net expense of 590. However, William's deduction is limited to 230 and Lakeisha's is maxed at 250, so they can only deduct 480, not the full 500, of course. Um, so yes, it's showing that each person qualifies for 250, not 500 total in the case of a married couple. Uh, you would think it would be a little higher to give uh, teachers a break, but it's not. Okay, so that is it for our deductions. This chapter isn't that large, which is why we just have one reading assignment this chapter. Um, I know my picture is not keeping up with my voice, but don't let that bother you. Um, anyway, so this is a shorter chapter and we'll have a video going over some of the uh, tax returns. This chapter is less complicated because they're not having you calculate a lot of these more complicated calculations. And instead they're just focusing on the criteria and for the tax returns, they'll just be telling you what amount is typically deductible. So it won't be too complicated. Okay, I will see you next time, guys. Let me know if you have questions. Bye.